book that just came out uh, in August. That's the story of our family finding a submarine that our dad was, was lost in. This is the submarine in question. It's a little bit longer than a football field, but it's only about 37 feet wide on the outside, but 16 feet wide on the inside. Think about, by the way, spending four months at sea where uh, there are 70 people in a narrow tube. So you get to know each other pretty well. This was our family in 1941. I'm the kid uh, sitting on the arm of the chair there. I'm the youngest of three brothers. It'll be important in a later part of this story. This was actually the crew of that submarine and their wives uh, meeting uh, at the New London, Connecticut submarine base because that's where they make submarines and they also uh, train people. Uh, because of the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, that was December 7th, 1941, remember, uh, the USS Grunion, that submarine you saw, was actually the first submarine launched after the U.S. declared war on Japan. And unfortunately, in September of 1942, my mother received this telegram, which is the we regret to inform you in this case, it wasn't that he had died, it's that he was missing. My mother was uh, a very responsible, loyal mother. She wrote a letter to the parents or the spouse uh, or sisters or family members of every single member on that submarine, several letters. Those people wrote letters back to our mother and she became kind of a, uh, a mother to them, and a lot of them needed it, young wives and so forth. Our dad won the Purple Heart. He had sunk several Japanese ships in this process, but my, brother, um, uh, my mother wrote to all the uh, uh, relatives again, saying that it was really in their honor, all of their honors, not just uh, my dad. My mother died in 1975, and my middle brother, who by that time had become uh, and retired from the Navy, he was a Navy pilot, uh, started to wonder, I wonder what happened to our dad. Because we never knew. The Navy listed as missing and presumed lost. My mother never remarried because she always thought that there was a chance that he might come back. So anyway, Brad put together this, this research, and what he did is he found names of people who had served with my dad uh, in other submarines and so forth that he'd gone to school with and so forth, and did a lot of research. And he was able to dig up a fair amount of information, but zero information in terms of what had happened to him. All we knew, and this was only through the grapevine, was that it was probably somewhere in the Aleutians. My brother's son's girlfriend's boss was a World War II history buff. And my brother's son's girlfriend had given that, what we called our gym book, the, the research that uh, my middle brother Brad had put together to this guy. And he contacted us and said that he knew there was an information about a possible confrontation between the USS Grunion and a Japanese freighter. This was, it came from uh, an article in an obscure Japanese maritime journal. This article was written by the captain of a freighter that the USS Grunion had had a confrontation with. Very complicated, in July 30th, 1942, uh, the USS Grunion was guarding the approaches to Kiska, an island in the western Aleutians. This is the freighter in question. It is actually beached on the island of Kiska in the western uh, Aleutians. And you can see it's a good-sized freighter, but actually was an armed freighter. It had guns on, uh, cannons on the bow and the stern, and of course, machine guns. But in all fairness, 
none of the shells that that ship had would be capable of sinking a U.S. submarine because the submarine was generally underwater and it has a double hull, so it would be very hard to penetrate with a very small shell. There were several officers on this uh, submarine, uh, on this uh, freighter rather, who had observed and recorded their observations about this confrontation between the submarine and the freighter. And they reported that they had shot at it, but in fact, it had uh, fired six torpedoes uh, at the freighter. One of them hit and blew up in the stern, taking out the engine, the radio room, and the stern gun. Two more went underneath the freighter, and then two more went directly into the side of the freighter and bounced off. Now think about that. If you are the captain of a submarine, and you're firing this torpedo, which, by the way, left little bubbles, so it's a little trail that tells them exactly where you are, and it bounces off, you probably wouldn't be very happy. And uh, the captain you know, documented this, and apparently when the torpedo went off, he said it was, he thought they were absolutely done for. Uh, but they were able to uh, beach it, and later on it was uh, bombed. In, in 2005, I was at a medical meeting in Florida, and the entertainment was uh, Dr. Robert Ballard. Dr. Ballard is the person who discovered the Titanic. I remember going up after him after he talked at that meeting and talking to him a little bit about the fact that we knew a little bit about our dad's submarine and sort of an approximate location, and did he think it would be possible to find it? And his response to us, well, you don't have enough information, and I would only go after ships that I'm sure I could find. And uh, he later came out, this is at Boston Scientific, and uh, helped us go through the analysis of the strategy of how you go about doing it. Unfortunately, he was working on a project in the Black Sea and wasn't available to work on our project. And I remember saying after a while, you know what, I think we can do that. In 2006, we hired a crab boat, an Alaskan crab boat. They have two cranes on it, and they, we had some 40-foot uh, freight containers uh, in which we set up uh, a little uh, sonar shack. And on this ship, uh, we had sonar. Now, sonar is using sound or echolocation as a way to find uh, uh, targets on the bottom. And this thing, uh, there were two of them. One is on the lower left. Uh, that was a high-frequency one, and this one is a low-frequency one. Low-frequency goes further distance. High-frequency goes shorter distance. And the ship would be sitting on the surface there, having a long line going down to a very heavy weight, which holds things down. And then between that weight and what they call the side scan sonar, or it's also called a towfish, that's hanging on a very flexible tether so that if the ship is bouncing up and down, that acts as a cushion so the towfish does not move, and that gives you a clearer image. This is the inside of the sonar shack, quite a team. This was the actual uh, team there. This was the first sonar image where we got a target that we thought was fairly interesting. Now, I don't know about you, but this looks like sort of a cigarette smudge on a piece of paper. However, people who know what they're doing said, well, you know, that might be something. The bottom, as it turns out, was fairly sandy. If it had been full of rocks, we couldn't have found anything. And here's one with even more magnification. After all that stuff was done, we had them put together a collage of all the different sonar tracings they'd put together. This occupies almost a square mile of distance. And what's fascinating about this is there's a funny little mess over here, which is where it might have hit the bottom. And then there's a line that goes in sort of a semicircle all the way up to that red circle up there where we 
said that's where the target was. We didn't know it was the Grunion, but that was our, our hope that it would be. In 2006, when we did this sonar trip, four United States submarines that had been lost in World War II, there was a total of 52 that had been lost, but most of them they know what happened to, but four of them that were lost, lost, like our dads, were found. None of them were found by the U.S. Navy. Three of them were found through efforts of family members who had gotten together. And um, one of them was found by uh, recreational divers who, who were searching for it. This is the ship again in 2007. And that is in the harbor at, at, at Kiska. Uh, this is the crew we have now. And this is actually on the island of Kiska. Uh, in fact, just to the left here, there was actually a Japanese shrine uh, when they had occupied it. And this was the device we brought with us uh, on the crab boat this time. Uh, that's an ROV, remotely operated vehicle, uh, which is loaded with, with uh, television cameras. When we got out there, basically the night that we arrived at Kiska, the ocean was calm. The ocean is never calm out there. So we said, you know, we're, we're getting some help here. Let's take advantage of it. And, and indeed we did. This is the front of that ROV. And you can see there are uh, a couple of video cameras. And that vertical device on the right is, is actually a short range sonar. This is after we lowered, all oh, about 30 minutes after we lowered our ROV 3,000 feet down. And you can imagine looking at a ship like this. You know, that's not just a ship. That's my dad and 16 other sailors' graves. This is getting a little bit closer. That's the stern of the ship. Uh, that's a laser beam we're shooting down to uh, market. That's the dive plane that it's hitting. There's a rudder that's vertical that's on the left, and that's the uh, starboard propeller, the right-hand propeller. And up above, that funny structure that comes out is what were called at the time propeller guards. And uh, they were generally removed from submarines. Uh, but the order to have them removed uh, didn't come until October of 1942. And this ship was basically sunk in uh, July of 1942. And there's that picture that I just showed you uh, in 2007 on the left. And the picture of the submarine that was launched in 1941. And you can see they both have rudder guards. One of the challenges we had is getting to the Navy to recognize that, in fact, this really was the, the Grunion. We had some people help us uh, reconstruct with a drawing uh, of what it looked like. About 50 feet of the bow had been broken off. So apparently when it dived down, it hit the bottom and, and just uh, broke it. However, it looked like it had been opened with a can opener. It would split, literally, from one end to the other. And that's because at 3,000 feet, that submarine is not designed to last. It will implode. Uh, the, the operating depth was generally don't go below 300 feet. It might have lasted until 600 feet. And then absolutely instantaneously, it would collapse. The good thing is, is they would have died instantly. But uh, it had torpedoes in the, uh, the bow and the stern, uh, two huge engines. Submarines, remember, are really hybrid vehicles, just like a Prius. Uh, they operate with diesel on the surface, and then they use batteries uh, underneath. But they could only stay about uh, 24 hours underwater uh, with the batteries. This was one of the close-up pictures with a hatch that was open. Initially, we thought that the only way they could open that hatch would to be on the surface. Uh, but in fact, we took a closer look. And uh, some people pointed out that that's, that hatch uh, dog, they call it, was broken off. So when that submarine imploded, 
it actually created so much pressure inside the, the submarine that it popped the hatch. Thousands and thousands of pressures a pound. That's the uh, four-bladed propeller and the uh, dive plane. Um, went a little bit too far here. Uh, some of the, the metal looked as if it was almost new. We basically created a network, uh, a crowdsourced network, and then we put together a video. We had taken three hours of high-definition video at 60 frames a second, which means that we could take adjacent pictures and create a three-dimensional anaglyph of that, so you could get a three-dimensional still picture, and uh, passed it to people, and they passed it back to us with the notes about uh, what they thought went wrong. So the next improbable was what we call the sublators. All of these women are actually relatives of sailors who were lost on the Grunion, but they're all amateur genealogists. And uh, their goal was to find relatives for every single crewman on the sub, 70 in all, and they did just that. Here, for example, it was, was, was one of them, and we were able to get uh, pictures even when he was married. Uh, he was one of the officers on the Grunion, and he had a son named Peter, but it wasn't uh, Peter Thomas, it was Peter Stevens, <laughs> his son's name. Now, that was obviously the wife remarried, and this is how Vicky of the sublators found Peter Stevens. Part of this process was to have a memorial service for every single sailor who had been sort of forgotten and get a little story. So the, the sub ladies worked on that and uh, they got a lot of stories published, hundreds, uh, for every single one. And lest you think that this is sort of grandstanding, the phenomenon is every time we did this, every time a new story came out, we got more information back. And we were able to fill in all this very, very complex puzzle uh, palace, if you will, with all sorts of information. This submarine here is a museum in Cleveland, Ohio, called the USS Cod. It turns out it's the sister ship of the USS Grunion, which was very helpful to us when we were doing our engineering forensics because now we could actually look at what a model looked like and therefore when we took our wreckage pictures and compared them with the various elements of that, we were able to figure out exactly what happened. And we had several hundred people, not bad since there were only 70 crew members, but hey, lots of relatives and uh, were able to hold uh, a service there. And at that point, the United States Navy recognized us officially. And of course, we thought that that actually was as big a task as finding the sub in the first place. We had a bell that uh, was rung at this uh, service. And maybe you uh, can't see it, but what they did is they ring the bell. It's a service for all the submarines that have been lost. That's the, sub, that's the bell. Now, you, you got to say, wait a second. That submarine is at the bottom of the Bering Sea, 3,000 feet down. Where'd the bell come from? The bell came from Greenville, Mississippi, in the Welcome Center. And it turns out there was a Presbyterian minister there who was a chaplain in World War II. And at one point, he was stationed in Pearl Harbor, and he saw this bell in the trash heap and said, gee, this is a beautiful bell. I'd like to take it back to Greenville, Mississippi. And uh, initially they said no, as, as the Navy normally does. And uh, finally, um, he got it. They sent it to him. And so that bell went back home. And uh, they in Mississippi, outside of the minister, didn't discover until we told them that one of the sailors on the Grunion came from Greenville, Mississippi. This is a, sort of a famous Jewish book of prayer thing that, that relates, I think, to why we did what we did. And just a reminder, um, 
you know, we, we talk about war deaths today and so forth. There were four, over 400,000 Allied or U.S. military people lost in World War II. There were 50 million people who died as a result of World War II. That's 2.5% of the world population at time. World War II was the second war to end all wars. Now, obviously, we're not <laughs> excited about getting a third. And the way you help do that is make sure you remember what happened the last time. Thank you.